the unconsciously incompetent stage. That means you don't know that you don't know. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Who, who in the room here has been saved here at Lakewood like in the last six months? Like you're a new Christian. Can I see your hand? Hi. Thank you. All right. Welcome to the family. Well done. I love hanging out with new Christians. Love it. I'll go to coffee with them and just go, hey, man, tell me about Jesus. And they'll be like, man, I don't even know, man. I just come to church and I just start crying. (laughs) And I see the lights and the music and people are smiling and nobody's high. It's fantastic. (laughs) I was watching I was watching television a number of years back and and it was a (laughs) Christian programming and and Jan Crouch was uh, was interviewing this guy and and this guy had led this big revival over the weekend in, in the underserved area of, of Los Angeles and gang gang activity and drug activity and stuff and so he's telling this testimony of this guy who came to Christ and he's like man this guy came and he was addicted to heroin but God radically set him free and then he went and found his wife and they were estranged but God brought him back together and she came to Christ and the whole family came to Christ and his dad came to Christ and and, and you know everybody's like blown away in this amazing testimony he's like matter of fact he's here today and so Dan goes well he should come up here here come tell us so they're about to go off the air and she they hand the guy a mic which wow all right so they hand the guy a mic and, and she says, you know what? We're about to go off the air. Why don't you just pray, you know, and thank God for what he's done, man. It was the most tender, beautiful, unconsciously incompetent prayer you've ever heard in your life. He just says, oh, Jesus, man, thank you for saving me. Oh, and my wife. And he's crying and I'm crying and it's powerful. And then there's like this pregnant pause. And then he says, and devil. And then he just proceeded to cuss the devil out. <laughs> This is, this is internationally live, okay? I'm talking big, long street words. Like, he had, he did not have nice things to say. (laughs) And the screen, like the main camera is just shaking like this. And I went from crying and thanking God for a dude to screaming, laughing. And, and I just said, this is fantastic. This is somebody in the forming stage of their Christianity. And they don't know that they don't know that their yes, just coming to Christ, their yes triggered the grace of God. Amen. If, if you're married, if you're married, all you have at the beginning is a yes. I don't care how many books you read, how many experts Oprah had on her show, it doesn't matter. No, nothing prepares you for the fine print behind the yes, I do. Because at that time, it's like everybody's in white and she looks so beautiful and he actually looks handsome and she has a thought that this guy is going to come home every day at 5.15 p.m., dinner's going to be on the table, we're going to have two and a half kids. We're going to say grace and he's never going to want to play golf. He's never going to want to watch TV. He's always going to pick up his clothes. Drawers off the floor and stuff. I didn't realize how selfish I was as an individual until I got married. I thought I was just a nice singer guy. And then... You know, you're in, you're in the forming stage. All you have is a yes. You don't even recognize that it's grace sustaining you in that. And then you realize that the placement of my toothpaste is really important to me. <laughs> I didn't realize that before. I'll just move on from there. I love you, baby. (laughs) God has a way, though, of not keeping you there. My brother who just recently got saved, God is going to take you from the place of forming where you're just unconsciously incompetent and just happy to be 
to a place of what I call storming. Everybody say storming. Storming is the place of I am consciously incompetent. In other words, I know that I don't know. All I have is a yes. Somebody shout yes one time, just make sure we're here. All I have is a yes, and that yes triggers the grace of God, and it, and it shifts me into a, another place. Talking about shifting, the first car I ever had was a 1971 Volkswagen Bug. My dad, who is the cross between John Wayne and Clint Eastwood on a bad day, most of the time, really gruff and really matter-of-fact guy and, you know, very impatient and... And so he decides he's going to teach me how to drive. And so I'm in the, I'm in the front seat. I'm nervous and, and I'm trying to figure out the whole clutch to gas pedal ratio thing. And so pop the clutch six times or so. And he's getting frustrated and smoldering over here in the passenger seat. And, and so finally, finally I get it and we're moving and I'm about to celebrate this victory. And then the whole car starts shaking and rattling and smelling of gas like only a Volkswagen bug can. And, and it's loud. It's so loud that I can hardly hear him screaming, shift. <laughs> and the analogy holds true as a new Christian. You're in a new season and suddenly things start shaking around you and suddenly it's not all new and suddenly, you know, you don't have a ride to church. Now you got to figure out how to get there. And I know we gave you a Bible the first time you came, but now you have to read that Bible. And you know what I'm saying? Don't get nervous, anyone. In marriage, the shaking starts and you go, well, I don't know, man. I mean, a lot of people getting divorced. This probably won't matter much. I'm in the car and it's shaking. And all I can think of is this car. I've never been in a car, so it's about to explode. And in the movies, you roll out of the moving car. So I'm thinking maybe that's what I should do. Listen, don't let the shaking, don't let the storms of life cause you to prematurely eject. Stay in it. Storming seasons are good because they help you realize who you are and what you have. You realize in that moment, I am consciously incompetent. I don't know it all, but here's what, here's what I do know. That his grace is sufficient for me. Second Corinthians says his grace is sufficient. And that word sufficient, I've always seen the word sufficient like that'll do. That, that's just enough. Have you ever, you ever think that way? Like, okay, that's a sufficient amount. So we always sort of diminish that like it's just enough. It might get you over the edge. I like to vicariously live through a couple wealthy friends that I have. And I had a wealthy friend pick me up for lunch one day. And so we're, we're on our way to lunch. And he says, you know what? I need to stop by the Rolls Royce dealership. And I said, well, of, of course you do. <laughs> I guess that's what you do. So... We're, we go inside the dealership and he's off talking to somebody about his car and, and I start walking around the dealership and, you know, I'm claiming in the name of Jesus. I just, <laughs> this one right here, this is used, this is fine. Pre-owned, Lord. I'll give my Honda away. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, sort of, there's, there's a... There's a paper, you know how you go to dealerships and there's a paper on the second window there that, that gives the specs of the car? It says, you know, it's made this year, this is the color, this is the make, this is the model, it's a two-door, it's a four-door, whatever. And then under horsepower, it always says it has this much horsepower, it'll go this so much, you know, miles an hour. Okay, at, at Rolls-Royce, though, it said horsepower sufficient. In other words, here's Rolls-Royce saying, listen, dude, we're Rolls-Royce. <laughs> that ought to just be their, their slogan from now on. We're, we're Rolls-Royce. <laughs> we're good. How fast do you want to go? 
how far do you need to get there? How, how quick does this need to happen? We make jet engines. We are Rolls Royce. Our horsepower is sufficient. It's more than you're ever going to need. That's what the grace of God is. It's a never ending stream, more than you'll ever need, ever. It doesn't run out. Let's go back to the grace matrix. So in the storming, hang on. And God has a way of making the ceiling of storming the floor of what I'll call norming. I don't even know if that's a word, but as a songwriter, it rhymes, so I'm going to go with it. (laughs) In norming now, you are consciously competent. This is when the storm was worth it. This is when you've been married a few years and it's working. You've been coming to church and now you're in a part of a team. Informing, we have what we call here connect, grow, serve, and give. Informing, you're connecting. In, in storming, you're, you're growing. In norming, you're serving. Now stuff is working. You're consciously competent of what's going on. You're starting to understand your your reason for being, your reason for existing, your the call of God on your life. And and here's what's beautiful. It's the yes that started at forming, that continued in storming, that continues in in the norming process. Where you know that you know that it is grace sustaining you, carrying you, opening doors for you, strengthening your family. And what a great place to be. And I think all of us wish we could just kind of camp out there. But God has a way of even shifting us from there to this place called performing. And in performing now, now we're giving. Now this is, this just happens. We are unconsciously competent. You remember when Michael Jordan was like in his heyday and, and they'd play on Sunday afternoons and the Bulls would be playing the Knicks and Marv Albert would be there and Jordan would go on a hot streak and he'd like score 25 points just at will and he's penetrating and everything was working and Marv Albert would run out of things to say so he would just go, he's unconscious. <laughs> that means this was second nature to him. And I think in life, relationships, we hope to get to that point where it's not a struggle, but there's still a yes there. Talking about forming. I was 19 years old and I was playing drums in our worship team at church in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I really enjoyed playing the drums because I had no responsibility but to show up and play the drums. It's fantastic. And I got a call on a Wednesday morning and the pastor said, Hey, um, Israel, I want you to consider being our worship leader, our main worship leader. Our worship leader's moving and feel like, we just feel like God has something on your life and you're the guy. And I immediately got nervous and I said, um, I'll tell you what, Pastor, uh, praise the Lord, I'll, I'll pray about it. <laughs> Which is my way of saying, nah. <laughs> I'll pray about it. No, Lord, no. God said no. He said, well, I want you to pray hard and I want you to pray fast because you start tonight. So, you know what I did? My first thing was I got on the phone. I called my mom and I said, hey, mom, I get to lead worship tonight. And you know how moms are like, well, make sure you wear the right clothes and make sure your zipper's up, you know. It's a lot of people. I remember just saying, I get to. This is a privilege. And, and if you fast forward the clock, you know, I've been at Lakewood 10 and a half years now. And um, there are certain things that just sort of come. Oh, please don't clap for that. Sorry. There's certain things that do come as second nature. I'm not as nervous when I get up here to lead worship. I'm terrified speaking. I'll just say that right now. I'm in the forming stage of speaking. And Pastor Joel's like, hey, Israel, would you consider preaching for us Labor Day weekend? And, and I just want to so badly to go, well, I'll pray about it. 